أجمل ملاك يا حبيبي ما بيفرقش عنك عود قلبي أكون معاك يا ريت Our next destination is a three and a half hour drive away 230 kilometers south of Madaba is the township of Wadi Musa, the closest town to our next destination, the World Heritage Site of Petra. With a population of about 24,000, this little town was originally named after the valley where it sits. A village grew up around a spring, the same spring the Prophet Moses supposedly created striking the ground with his staff. We are staying in the luxurious five-star Petra Marriott Hotel, a hundred rooms of spacious comfort. Our second floor room was reached via a fascinating double-doored lift, and again our room had all the comforts we had come to expect from scenic tours. This time out the window was not the bomb site of the La Meridian Hotel Amman, but a spectacular view of the Petra Valley and the surrounding hills. Through the French windows downstairs, a beautiful swimming pool, and inside a spacious lounge and casual dining in unmatched surroundings. During our stay, we were entertained with the most spectacular sunset over the Petra Hills. It is still early and the bus park is almost empty. The temperature is already in the high 20s and we are about to make the 1.8 kilometre trek to the centre of a great hidden city, the ancient Nabataean city of Petra. There are three ways to get to the hidden city, by walking, by taking a horse-drawn cart, or by horseback. We have chosen to cover the first 700 metres by horseback, and this is the first time in many years that we have availed ourselves of this experience. Our friendly and congenial mounts will only take us part of the way, and for those walking to the gorge, it is a pleasant 15 minutes downhill. It's the 30 minute walk back uphill after a day in Petra that is exhausting. From the dismounting area we will walk the remaining 1100 metres through the gorge. We have been told the many rock formations are quite spectacular and the excitement is mounting. Our group soon starts to collect at the staging point and those who have come on horseback dismount and join the others. Our journey through the gorge, or Sikh, on foot is over a kilometre and as we enter the gorge we are greeted by a Roman centurion standing guard, no doubt a member of the Jordanian tourist police. Petra became part of the province of Syria in the Roman Empire in about 106 AD. Afterwards the city continued to flourish and reached the height of its splendour a century later. Although the Sikh is only three to four metres wide in parts, there is still room for a horse-drawn cart. Unfortunately, those on board will miss many of the dramatic rock formations and their fantastic colours. Running alongside of the Sikh is a 2,000-year-old water channel. Archaeological evidence suggests the area was subject to flash flooding. The Nabataeans controlled these floods by the use of dams, cisterns and water conduits. They also used aqueducts to transport water from local springs into the city. These innovations stored water for long periods of drought and enabled the city to prosper. No one really knows when the Nabataeans settled here. Some archaeologists suggest some time after the 6th century BC. They were an elusive and mysterious race and no one really knows for sure just how large their empire was. According to some historians, at its peak, the Nabataean Empire stretched from modern-day Yemen to Damascus, and from Iraq to the Sinai Desert. This deep and twisting gorge, 
soft rough with the ancient Roman road show through is the gateway to one of the most extraordinary and mysterious places ever created by man. Suddenly, a slit of strong light can be seen through the darkened rocks ahead. The moment has come. Through the dark perspective, half seen through the tall narrow opening, a magnificent facade. The columns, statues and cornices of El Kazne, the treasury of the Nabataeans. Without the stains of weather or age, almost as if it had been chiselled yesterday, the pale rose-coloured stone, warmed by the morning sun, El Kazne the treasury, is justly the most famous monument in Petra. Little has changed since it was discovered in 1812 by Swiss explorer Johann Ludwig Burkhardt. The elaborate facade is alive for the cast of Nabataean deities and mythological characters. Dancing Amazons, winged victories, Medusa heads, eagles and various mythical creatures. All are funerary symbols. Believed to be a storehouse of Pharaoh's wealth, deposited here by magic, the urn at the top was deemed to be the most likely repository. Every Bedouin Arab who owned a gun would take a shot at it as he passed. If he hit the right spot, the treasures of the Pharaoh would cascade down upon him. The result is a sadly battered urn. The Nabataeans were very wealthy traders and their caravans, some including up to a thousand camels, travelled widely. Most historians are still uncertain of the borders of their kingdom or the extent of their travel. As high as a 12-storey building, on each side of the main facade are holes that are unlikely to have been left by any wooden scaffold. The one thing in very short supply in this area is trees. Archaeologists suggest they were made long after the Kasne was built and were used by another race to destroy some of the figures. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, this magnificent facade is more than 2,000 years old. In 2007, it was voted one of the seven wonders of the new world. Many scholars believe that the 39 metre structure was built in the first century as the burial place for the rich and powerful Nabataean king Aratas IV. The bones of 11 individuals were found in four small chambers discovered below the edifice and excavated in 2003. Whatever the reason, the treasury is clearly designed to strike wonder into all who enter the Nabataean capital through the gorge. Every year, over half a million tourists trek the 1.2 kilometers through the gorge to see this wondrous sight. But on a day as hot as this, not many find their way to the outdoor cafe. From the treasury forecourt, we move into the street of facades, a narrow gorge that finally opens into the Petra Valley. These tombs have a simpler, more traditional look in their design. The street of facades in the Petra Valley contains at least 700 tombs, all cut from the rock face. This closed step frieze on the facade can be seen on many of the tombs. Across the street can be seen rock cut steps leading to a fissure in the rock. This fissure is actually an aqueduct used to bring precious water to the heart of the city. A lost jewel in the Arabian desert, ancient Petra was one of the world's most mysterious cities. The streets in rows one above the other are alive with tombs, or perhaps alive is not the right word. The theatre, constructed by the Nabataeans in the first century, stands at the southern end of the urban area. 
the only Roman amphitheatre cut from solid stone. The Romans demolished several tombs after the annexation and increased its capacity to about 8,000. Opposite the theatre is El Kupfa, a hill on which hundreds of tombs can be seen. Constructed around 70 AD, the Ur tomb has a deep cut colonnaded courtyard. These are Assyrian type monuments with crow step decorations running along the cliff face. It isn't known whether these served as houses or tombs, but over the centuries Bedouins have lived in the crypts and no doubt cleared them of any treasure. The palace tomb forms part of the royal tomb group, thought to be those of Nabataean kings and certainly amongst the most impressive of the tombs found here in Petra. The tomb of the obelisk has echoes of ancient Egypt. To the Nabataeans, the obelisk represented the souls of the dead buried with their contents, including their treasure. Petra has much to offer visitors, a must-see for anyone interested in archaeology, history and ancient cultures. Included is the spectacular landscape, scenic hiking trails and amazing archaeological relics. On the summit of Al Habes is a 12th century crusader fortress. Not much of the colonnaded street remains. Constructed after the Roman annexation, the columns are rubble lying beside the road. This small section of cobbled road is all that is left and the undulating surface was difficult to walk on. The six metre wide paved road runs down to Hadrian Gate and in 106 AD might have looked just like this. The colonnaded street ends at the triple arched or Hadrian's Gate, probably built in the second century. With huge wooden doors in Greco-Roman style, it acted as a ceremonial entrance to the sacred precinct of Quasar el Bint. The sacred precinct of the Qasar el Bint temple, dedicated to Dushara, the chief god of the Nabataeans, is the only substantial stone-built structure still standing in Petra. Built with blocks created during the making of el Kazne, the treasury, these can still be seen lying around on the ground. On the way back we meet a small two or three year old boy selling coloured stones. The Nabataeans had a reputation for being very rich traders. The occasional drink station becomes a welcome relief in the heat of the day. During the hottest part of the day temperatures can be well over 40 degrees centigrade. Even the little donkeys look for some shade amongst the desert rocks. Drinking lots of water to keep hydrated is important and a loose stop is sometimes necessary. In this toilet we see some of the amazing coloured rocks the Petra Valley is famous for and the incredible patterns and formations. At last we make it back to the treasury precinct and we only have another 1.2 kilometres to go. Perhaps it's time for more horseback riding. Hello? What's happening here? May we go home now, please? Ready? Indy! Henry! Follow me! I know the way! Ha! After you, Junior. Yes, sir. Ha! 